It's time now for Mark Meets, in which I speak to the biggest names in the world of politics, showbiz, sport and beyond. Tonight, the retired detective police officer and best-selling author Mark Williams Thomas, who uncovered the scale of Jimmy Savile's crimes and helped achieve closure, if not justice, for Savile's thousands of victims. Mark Williams Thomas, welcome to GB News. Hi, Mark. Uh, when did Jimmy Savile's crimes come to your attention? So I was just coming back from Interpol. I'd been over there filming a piece for BBC Newsnight. And on the way back, the producer said to me, have you ever heard about Jimmy Savile being interviewed in relation to child abuse offences? And I said, no. I said, he's a completely weird person. I wouldn't want him anywhere near my kids, but I'd never heard anything. He said, well, he was. He was either interviewed by your old force, Surrey, or by Sussex. But we don't know which, and we can't really find out. And I said, well, I'll be able to find out pretty quickly. So I did. I went back. I made some calls. And then I found out that it was, in fact, uh, my ex-force, Surrey, that had spoken to him. I'd left by that stage. I went back to him, and he went to his editor. And at that stage, this is when it all fell apart, because BBC Newsnight said, there's no story. There's no story because there's not a police cover-up. And I went back to him and said, but that's not the story. The story is that he is an alleged sex offender. That's the story. Mm. But he didn't get it. And they said, the editor said, well, we're going to drop it, we're not going to run it. And they didn't have the full story anyway. They only had uh, some witnesses. They didn't have the background in terms of all the victims. And I said, listen, I've now started to do some inquiries. I've looked on the internet. There's quite a bit of rumours around. I think there's more to this. Let me pick it up and run with it. And he said, well, you're probably the only person that would be able to do it. Give it a go. So I started to look at it and, you know, fast forward 10, 11 months later, we amassed eight separate victims. We were really important to take it away from the, the Duncroft, which was the uh, children's home, mm -hmm. and make sure that we took it elsewhere because it's very easy for the public to say, well, they're, they're damaged kids, so of course they're going to say something. So we took it away from that. We got victims from Top of the Pops. We amassed these eight victims. There was a number of other victims as well, and we went to... You know, to the execs in ITV, who were still incredibly nervous about this, massively nervous. Mm. Uh, and finally, you know, we broadcast the programme, and, and the fallout of it was, was massive. You know, this was a story that sat on the front pages for 41 consecutive days. National newspapers for 41 consecutive days caused the director general to retire, and it affected and changed policy around all of the establishments, both police, criminal justice, as far as the CPS goes, social services. It changed everything. And significantly, it gave a voice. It gave a voice to so many people. We had a, a letter within the first couple of weeks after the programme went out from the director of the NSPCC. Uh, and he said, Mark, as a direct result of your programme, over a thousand children have been saved. So it was a huge result. I mean, it wasn't, you know, I was the vehicle for it. I pulled it all together in an investigative way. But it was only possible because of those women who appeared on the programme who were confident enough and put their trust in us to tell their story. How did Savile operate? How did he get away with these crimes? Well, several first started offending in the 1950s. Uh, through was, he, was he a name even then, by the way? No, he wasn't. I mean, he became a name. Uh, he kind of made his name in creating a brilliant, brilliant concept, which was young teenager, teenagers love music. Mm. So what I'll do is I'll get a massive hall, I'll play records, and I'll charge them 50p a pound to come in. And that was making him a lot of money. And so he'd rung them two, three times a week, particularly the weekends. And, of course, that then started to bring children into his, into his world. Uh, and as a result of that, obviously, he then started to offend. You know, his early offending behaviour uh, began very early in the 1950s and 60s. But he also had a really brutal side. So in those early days, he certainly you know, trampled on other people who were running businesses as far as running music venues and would have them beaten up. Really? So he was completely ruthless. Um, and to what extent did, did he groom not just his victims, but the police and other authority figures? Well, I think it was a step-by-step -step process. So his early process, as far as grooming, was, was particularly his victims. But then he moved on to grooming p adults around him in order to be able to get access, because any element of offending behaviour is both access and opportunity. You've got to have the access to the person you're going to abuse, and you've got to have the opportunity. Nobody else around, no CCTV, all, all those things. So what he did is he very carefully manufactured the access and opportunity by grooming those around him. And that continued all all the way up until the end of his life. So the other families were starstruck, for example? Families, 
people who worked with him, his producers, the execs. And as he became more famous, it became easier for him because, of course, people then said, well, that's just Jimmy Savile. He's just like that. Uh, and then they, they would turn a blind eye for it. Um, and then, of course, when we finally get to the police interview, and we've all heard, you know, those that mm. follow the story would have known that the police were, were really in awe of him when they sat and interviewed him. He said to them, look, you know, I'm going to sue you. I'll sue you if, if this turns out you know, you're going to pursue this. So it was really very threatening in terms of that's what he did. You know, he'd get letters quite regular from people making threats against him in relation to his abuse saying they're going to expose him and he would get that he would send a letter to them he would he would be very litigious in terms of that and so he was he was constantly on the guard looking and actually incredible really that he wasn't exposed earlier but today if this had happened today he would have been and I'll tell you why because social media has completely changed the landscape mm. And in terms of the Beeb, do you think there are parallels with, with how they handled it to perhaps how the Catholic Church have handled their abuse scandal? Are there parallels? Yeah. I mean, the Catholic Church was completely in denial that anything took place. And, it only, and, and it worried took, about their reputation. Oh, massively. You know, internally covering their backsides the whole time. And the BBC did exactly the same. I mean, I, what frustrated me so much, so we went to the BBC, once we'd pulled the programme together, we went to the BBC and said to the BBC, these are the allegations, would you give us comment? Directly to the Director General. And the Director General's response from their office was, no, we don't think there's anything in it, we're not going to give you anything. Right, um, and, uh, and that was it. And then they took that stance for about a week because there was a, that was the gap of kind of the right to apply and then the press got involved and then the story started to get bigger and bigger and up until the the morning of broadcast they kept changing their right to reply their response to us that they wanted to say and it slowly got from a position of the starting point which was nothing's gone wrong we know nothing's happened etc to we are going to look at this all the director general, I mean, this is about media management. And so often the crisis that we deal with are because the media has been managed so badly. Mm. And the BBC, I mean, there was an executive at the BBC, very senior executive, who met with a very senior executive at ITV on the day of broadcast and said to them, I don't really think this is going to go very big, is it? Crazy. And the ITV exec said, mm, I'm not sure about that. Possibly among the most famous people in the country. Um, how low did Savile go in terms of his crimes? Oh, brutal. I mean, he had the run of, of Stoke Mandeville Hospital for yeah, a start. I mean, he, the Stoke Mandeville, there's still an awful lot that hasn't come out in relation to Savile. Um, but the Stoke Mandeville... Sa disabled children. I mean, he he knew, knew no bounds. I mean, his offending behaviour was whatever he wanted to get away with. He would commit his offences, whether it be against the young child in a wheelchair, disabled in a, in a bed. Um, he was... And he was also very brutal in terms of how he did it. I remember interviewing one of the ladies um, and he'd raped her and he'd given her a venereal disease. And the way she was describing it, and it, it was a point to which, and at every stage when you do an investigation, there's certain things that people tell you which never leave you. And I remember her telling me about how he'd, he'd forced himself on her and he'd given her a venereal disease. And, and the way she described it, you knew straight away that he just didn't care. He did not care. He, he got what he wanted, and for them, they were just collateral damage. Uh, Nicola Bully has gone missing, mother of two. It's a tragic story, a nightmare for the family. Uh, what's happened to her? Where is she? Well, I don't know. I wish I did know. I've been up there this week um, as a result of being asked by the family to go up Your there. Your coverage has been very compelling, I've got to say. Thank You've you. You've been critical of the police response. Yeah, hugely critical. I mean, I, I went up there with a very open mind in terms of, of what's taken place. And I have been, you know, was critical before I went up there. And I went up there specifically as a request of the family. The problem is, is that the police have slowly got worse and worse. Because what we've ended up with now is a debacle from a press office, press conference the other day, where for the very first time they announced that there was she had vulnerability. I don't know whether that was a deliberate, whether that was intended. It kind of came across as it was one of them released it and then they had to go with it. But what then followed in the hours after that was this need for them to explain what that meant, because they refused to say it in the press conference. Mm. Then they needed to explain it. And then they came out with, she was suffering from, um, you know, she had a, a, an alcohol, an issue with alcohol and menopause. Let's be very clear. That is 
utterly, utterly appalling information to share. It's detrimental both in terms of Nicola and, of course, if she come, she's alive and comes back, how does she do that? But also to the family. And it, and it means that the public will have these preconceived ideas. Oh, so she's an alcoholic. So what was she doing on the morning driving? All of these things, which are not true to the degree, you know, that's interpretation. What they should have done is on day one said this is a, a high-risk misper... She is currently suffering from depression. She's got some mental health issues. They're all being helped. She's getting some help for it. Mm. And we're doing everything we can. That would have stopped it because the public would have gone, get it. Um, briefly, what are the percentage chances, given the fact that you know about these cases, the percentage chances that she will be found? Well, she, I think she'll be found. The, the question, of course, is will she be found alive? Right. The, the reality is, is there's three elements to, to what's taken place. Either she went in the water at the location where they say she did. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that's true, and, of course, they've searched it. So the other aspect is, is she going to the water at another location? It's possible that she went into the water beyond the weir, which is where there's a tidal element of it, right. or she left off her own free will. And the very significant thing is the one area that doesn't have CCTV is the one area that she always used. So when the police say, we're pretty sure she didn't leave the area, they absolutely can't say that. There's no CCTV in that area, and that's exactly the route she walked in, and it would be exactly the same route she would walk out. Uh, let me tell you that Mark Williams Thomas has a brand new book out. It is a bestseller. It's winning rave reviews. It is called Hunting Killers. Uh, through tireless research and perseverance, uh, Mark Williams Thomas takes us on a journey of discovery, gathering and pursuing new evidence, earning the trust of silent witnesses and sharing the personal toll this extraordinary job takes on him. Uh, fascinating uh, book. It's Our Now Hunting Killers. Thank you to Mark Williams Thomas.